We move on now to Malky, so we're going to get a nice overview of all this. So if we can kind of row back a little bit, uh, that'll be great. Uh, most of you will have seen uh, Malky's bucket list, which is a uh, uh, fascinating list that he does every year. He, uh, he's really very good at picking winners. What he can't always tell us is when they're going to become uh, winners. Uh, if we knew that, we wouldn't all be sitting here, would we? So uh, uh, let us uh, uh, hear from the man who has an unrivaled 30 years' experience uh, in oil and gas, widely quoted, of course. His daily blog uh, is an excellent read. I was looking at it uh, only yesterday. Um, he's a founding partner of the independent advisory Hydrocarbon Capital, a director of uh, Maven Income and Growth uh, VCT4, Venture Capital Trust. Don't know what happened to uh, VCTs 1, 2, and 3. Perhaps we shouldn't ask. Uh, he started his career at Wood Mackenzie, and he was uh, an inaugural member of the, uh, the number one Excel rated James Capel oil and gas team, taking us back a bit there. And uh, let's uh, hear from him now. Thank you. Sorry. Maven 1, 2, and 3 are absolutely ticking to move, as are 5 and 6. <laughs> Excellent. Um, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have been invited here uh, in such illustrious company to talk about the subject that I love. I've been... Uh, in August next month, I will have worked for 39 years in the oil and gas sector, starting as a graduate trainee with Wood Mackenzie in August 1979. And you've saved me from having to do the 10K, which is very healthy. And up there, you know, it's lovely to have two great uh, oil men on either side, like a, a thorn between two roses. Um, I've been asked to do a sort of swift run through of everything. I'll, I'll give a quick run through of the macro side um, to try and address one or two of the questions that have been asked. Uh, then we'll have a quick look at the bucket list. I've, got, I've been given a bit of time, but more than happy to take uh, questions uh, at, at, the, at the end or whenever you like, to be honest. Um, the bottom line on the macro front, uh, with Brent a little bit up to date, at about 73 in West Texas, just under 69. Uh, the June OPEC Plus meeting restored, as we know, uh, the November 2016 levels of production. Uh, at the time, the price was looking like it was going to exceed $80, uh, much to Donald Trump's ire uh, when he tweeted to bring it down and asked the, or told the Saudis to produce 2 million extra barrels a day. They can't do that. They might be able to increase their capacity by 2 million barrels a day. I think they could do a million in the short term. They put a half a million barrels on already. In fact, they jumped the gun for that meeting because by the end of June they were already producing an extra, an extra half a million barrels a day. Um, and elsewhere, in terms of supply adders, uh, they're the only meaningful amount. Um, Q8 can do a bit, the UAE can do a bit. We've got a bit of sort of come and go from Libya and Nigeria, which I'll mention. Uh, Libya could do more if it had uh, stability, which it lacks at the moment. Uh, Nigeria just hiked a little bit after Shell lifted two months of force majeure. Uh, in Russia, they've added 150,000 barrels a day. They've gone over 11 million barrels a day, uh, and they're uh, increasing very slowly. Uh, the ghost at this particular party is probably what you've been hearing about in the last day or two, which is uh, the potential for the president to release uh, oil from the US SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, it's over full to the tune of about 270 million barrels. Uh, they've got 660 million barrels in stock at the moment. The, IE, the, the EIA rules and the IEA rules allow them to keep, to sell more down if they need to. It might be dribbled out, but I would have thought they'll keep this potential supply uh, for a rainy day, in particular at the beginning of November, uh, when Iran will suddenly peter out. Talking of Iran, if you're talking about where you are oil supply short, uh, we know that they're heading for major supply uh, export interruptions when those sanctions come into place. I expect about one million bar <coughs> barrels a day to, be, uh, to, to come off, probably a bit more. Um, and uh, you'll notice that the, one of the reasons for the oil price falling yesterday was that um, the two uh, guys um, in, the, in the state said that they might do some waivers. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt they won't do any waivers. They might, one of them is traveling to India in the hope that They'll be able to say, I mean, the Indians have said that they won't be taking Iranian crude, but they do take a lot of Iranian crude. I would say that, as I said in the blog today, that waiver might be a question of saying, uh, we'll give you a chance to change where you buy your oil from. Venezuela is still in free fall. 
Uh, no signs of a pickup there. Something drastic would happen, have to happen there, and I don't expect it. There are one or two niggly places in the world where there are problems. Uh, the Syncru breakdown in Canada has taken about uh, half a million barrels a day off the market. Some of it's already coming back. The rest will be back uh, in two months' time. There's a strike in Norway, which isn't affecting anything at the moment, but there are now 900 uh, strikers off the, uh, off the rigs. It'll make a sentimental difference, not at all. Conclusion on the oil prices, while $80 was a tempter for OPEC, uh, the danger of harming the long-term demand was an important factor which they took into account. Uh, the arrival of a million barrels a day, half a million we have already, should, all things being equal, keep oil in the $70 to $80 range. Uh, I expect significant demand in the second half, uh, and OPEC um, production should roughly satisfy that. Stocks are obviously the key. Since 11-16, uh, well stocks have substantially fallen uh, as consumers ate into that excess. Uh, the cartel wanted those stocks down to what they call the five-year average. They're now below that and not included in the SPR. The stocks should remain broadly the same at the moment. Um, the dangers, well, the dangers on the upside that there is now pretty much no spare capacity in the system at all. Once uh, Saudi are producing 11 million barrels a day by the end of August, which is what they say they do, and I think they can do, there's, there's nowhere else to go if there's, a, if there's an outage of any sort. Once the Iran is shut down successfully, the, uh, the market will remain very tight. Any strikes, pipeline breakages, Libya problems or Nigeria problems would, uh, would create problems. On the downside, I think 2019 might prove a more balanced market. Uh, the demand won't pick up much more, and I expect to see uh, supply picking up a little bit in the US, for example. Uh, so the call on OPEC crude is probably going to fall a little at the, uh, <coughs> at the beginning to the middle of next year. The key point here is that they should, the OPEC plus, as they're called, should remember how effective the 1116 accord was. And they should realize then that if all they have to do is discipline breaks down, they should go for, and they want to go for market share, that's where they're going to be in trouble. They know that if they just start rattling back production a little bit, they should be able to keep the price just where they want it. And I think that is 70 to $80 uh, dollars a barrel. Any other outlook problem would be, of course, significant GDP uh, weakness in the US or in, in China. So. Um, the outlook for oil shares is, I think, reasonably rosy in the sense that at the moment, and I'm, Stephen may disagree, but it, it, the outlook for market, the current market conditions for oil companies are about as good as it gets. 70 plus oil compares with most companies' internal models, which I think are done at 50, um, but more importantly, it's about costs. Since 2015, I reckon most companies have cut costs by between 50 and 70% making margins way higher than they were when oil was $115. Look at assets that have been discovered in the last three or four years that are being developed at today's costs and today's high oil prices. And that immediately makes you think of the Cairn Far discovery, the world-class discovery in Senegal, Lancaster for Hurricane, and of course, Sea Lion for Premier and Rock Hopper. Been watching the statements very carefully from the oil field service companies, because this is where the cost might start to hit, uh, see how they're doing at the moment. We'll get interims in August from most of them, but the trading statements in June have generally been a good guide. There are some special situations, particularly <coughs> if you bear in mind hunting, for example, in the US, uh, where demand in the Permian and places has meant that they just can't sell enough from places like the Titan business and prices have kept up with the strength of the order book. Elsewhere, I would say at the moment that uh, the companies have been reporting good levels of business without significant price increases. Again, Stephen might be able to see, see more on the ground activity there. So margins are only slowly rising, and uh, in the areas hardest hit, like rigs and seismic, are picking up, but only slowly. I think it's uh, a good time to be an oil company at the moment. Hmm. Just, just the glass that's already poured is great. Thanks very much. So the bucket list. Um, the bucket list started um, 
nearly four years ago, I suppose, uh, it started because a non-energy specialist, a guy who's currently chairman of an asset management business called Lion Trust and he used to be head of Gartmore, knew nothing about the oil industry but did know about what he considered to be commodity cycles always turn around. So he asked me to produce uh, a, a list of stocks. It turned out it was starting to be a baker's dozen, but a little more than that, that would provide a decent return over a long period of time with a mix of beaters. So investing at what he hoped was the bottom. Now, we did this in, uh, in 2015, uh, and obviously we didn't see the low until February 2016. Uh, um, but the plan for this list of stocks was meant to be, you know, the, the companies are meant to have good entrepreneurial management, uh, attractive portfolios with near and medium and long-term growth prospects, uh, well-financed, at least in the, in the area that they weren't dependent on partner cash calls, i.e., you know, a bit low on cash and all of a sudden your partner comes up and says, I want to do this and you can't afford it, nor in a position where you have to rush to the market because in those... In those times, in 16 and 17, the market can see you coming a mile away, as you all know. Um, the other thing they needed was, that, I mean, the list is geolog geographically diverse. You've got stocks in there in the UK, in Norway, lots of Africa, Romania, Trinidad, South America, Central America, and Kurdistan. And the other thing is that, uh, as you will know, is that uh, one should be aware that the management should be aware of the needs of shareholders, particularly retail shareholders, because in the last five years, there has been a significant shift in power. Uh, institutions no longer rule the roost. Uh, in some cases, we've had three or four years ago where institutions were holding 50, 60, 70 percent of the stock, and now it's over 50 or 60 percent in retail hands. Some managements are better at, at, than others at dealing with the message. So the bucket list, as you know, um, I'm going to whistle through it and then we can take individual questions or people can ask why wasn't certain thing in or, or why it was. But uh, last year it was a very disappointing, well, it was disappointing in the sense that the oil price ran up, the bucket list didn't perform as well as I'd hoped. Uh, it didn't surprise me too much because I know over the years that the sector always lags a rise in the oil price and the investors need to have a uh, significant uh, confidence in the oil price. So, starting from the, um, the top down, in terms of uh, how the, this is the interim performance. Uh, so we've got 18 stocks uh, in, in the bucket list. Uh, and uh, funnily enough, Rock Copper up 73.6 and Premier up 71.6 was the sea lion case. People, you know, I mean, Rock Copper has been in the portfolio since the beginning for that very reason. It's taken longer than I thought to come out. But it's up 70% on the year so far. Uh, it'll be up significantly more, providing the oil price stays up and the team in particular, the Premier Board, give it the FID in towards the end of this year, which I'm expecting. Premier, of course, have got other fish to fry, and they're doing it very well operationally, with obviously with Catcher, uh, Toll Mount, and success in Mexico. But they only squeaked over the line in terms of financial uh, strength with two and a half billion dollars worth of debt uh, because at the time I thought that operationally they were doing extremely well. Third on the list obviously was Hurricane, uh, which uh, I think speaks for itself. I mean, technically I probably should have taken it out of the bucket list last year in June when they raised $530 million uh, and tried to put it back. As, we, as uh, Nigel said, well, we, I am not a stock picker in terms of timing. I'm trying to talk about stocks which have got embedded value of a significant amount. Everybody in this room is better than me at picking stocks on a day trading basis, on a longer term basis. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I don't deal in stocks and shares. Yeah, do you uh, hold any of these stocks before I hold, I, I hold no long short positions in shares or warrants in anything on the bucket list. Years and years of being in investment banking and acting for companies meant that I was never allowed to. I always decided that, that starting when the blog started to, to, to get so many uh, people reading it that uh, the best thing to do would be not to hold anything. So no one can come up to me and say, you've given Rock Copper or Sound or Echo a really good plug and have you just bought a few and then you're going to sell them tomorrow? And the answer is no. So um, back to Hurricane. 
it would, you know, sensible people would have done that. I kept it in there because I believe it's worth a fortune. Uh, I believe in what Dr. Trice is doing with fractured basements, um, and we are going to find out PDQ, it, whether it's going to work or not. Uh, I did an interview with him, as you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I sat down with him last week to talk about how things are going in Dubai. All the kit is on time. The FPSO is on time. Sail away is on time, and it'll take six weeks uh, to get to, to the site, to Lancaster, uh, even including a stop off in Holland for some kit. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, we know what the downside is. Fractured basin won't flow the 17,000 barrels a day off the, off the EPS. Um, it's a risk we all have to take. I think that it, uh, I've, I've seen enough of the of the numbers and the charts and everything else, and I've seen it works elsewhere. I'm taking the plunge and saying, I think uh, um, Hurricane is worth significantly more than a pound a share. And, and if I was a, a slightly risky and wealthy senior oil company, I would start buying a lot of shares in this company right now, because as soon as it does start to produce 17,000 barrels a day, and it does it for a period of time, and it could be as, as early as January or February. People keep saying to me, will they start early? Well, the thing is, once the, the FPSO gets on site, the, both the wells, as we know, have been primed and ready to go. So uh, it, it, it will not be long after that. Bob Try says six to 12 months after that, it'll be um, proof of the pudding. I think people won't take that long to work it all out. Um, and of course, the, 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 the next success story in the list was FAR. Um, I don't know how many of you have any interest in FAR. It's an Australian quoted ASX stock. Uh, I think it's worth an absolute fortune because it just hasn't had the chance yet. It's up 47% this year now. Uh, there's two reasons for that. First of all, obviously, people taking into account the value of its holding in the Senegal find, uh, and, uh, and that's big. And of course, there's arbitration going on at the moment. There's no downside for FAR in that arbitration because it's trying to decide uh, between Woodside and Conoco uh, how the JV agreement worked. Um, but also the Gambia, which not many people know about the situation in the Gambia, uh, but it is adjacent to Senegal. It's in the same, uh, you know, on, on the same line, and it's uh, quite possibly uh, a very substantial um, very, very big target for FAR, and they'll be drilling that at the end of this year. So we've got, um, we've got FAR in there, um, and, uh, uh, and I think it'll do a lot better. Um, the next one up was, was FARO, which you know is, a, is a very much an old favorite, a bit in the, in the mold of Ithaca. Um, they, they're successfully drilling all the time. Uh, crafty dealings in the asset market, when they find something, they develop it, sell off a bit of it, uh, and develop the next. They always in, in the license round, particularly in Norway. And of course, DNO bought, first of all, 17% from Delek, then another 10%, another 3%. They've got 28.23% of the company. Um, and then they raised $500 million in a, in a, in a bond issue. So Faro is, uh, is copper bottomed. And of course, the next one was Echo, which is up 32.5% since February. Echo was almost borderline about whether it should go in at the time, because I thought most of the Echo story would happen in the middle to the second half of the year. Um, but having interviewed Fiona and realized there were a few things coming up you know, uh, in terms of workovers and, and two or three rigs, if these came in, I thought it would be very successful. Took the plunge and put it in. Um, I'm interviewing Fiona on core finance tomorrow, by the way. Uh, so we should have an interesting um, chat tomorrow about what's going on. But I think there's masses of upsides there already. And, and they haven't even gone anywhere near uh, the, the, the big stuff yet. So after that, we've got SDX, which was actually in the lead at Christmas. Uh, SDX uh, is, as you know, Morocco and Egypt. Um, took a trip out there uh, to the Moroccan assets uh, a, few, a few months ago. Um, Paul Welsh is doing a fantastic job there. I mean, that Moroccan business is, is making money like it's going out of business because they are finding, they've sent seven out of the nine wells they've drilled uh, this year have been successful. In particular, the two northern ones, which were both ranked wildcats, both came in. Uh, so they're going to get up to their 50 million scuffs, and they will, um, 
make significant margins. Just to give you an idea, uh, the gas price in Morocco is controlled by the government and it's just moved up to ten and a half dollars an MCF. Their costs are about 50 cents an MCF, uh, which tells you how much money they'll make out of that. They've got a, a, glo a, a big industrial zone there. They've just signed up Peugeot. And uh, so, you know, I don't see any problem with that. In Egypt, there's another announcement yesterday from South to Souk, and they'll be uh, producing all that by the end of the year as well. Next up was Rear Bold Resources, up 20% since February. You're about to hear from Steve, so I won't, uh, I won't go into any details there um, because I'm very impressed with what Session and Steve have done. Uh, it's probably the quickest from meeting a company to getting into a bucket list, but I really believe in what they're doing. I think the model is fantastic, and through Karelian and Danube and the Gaelic Resources, I think there's lots of upside in the second half. Um, next up is uh, Savannah. Um, oh, I missed Jersey. Jersey Oil and Gas. It, people ask why it was in a bucket list, and because the, a lot of people say, yeah, look at the bucket list, and it's a list of favorite stocks, and I want to pick one here and there. That wasn't the idea to begin with. It was meant to be, you know, buy all these, and, and you should do okay. But why was it in there last year? Because it was a rank wildcat, one-off only well in the North Sea. And if you remember, when it first drilled, it looked like it was a failure. <laughs> Uh, and um, Statoil, as it was then, uh, had a lot of uh, confidence that it, that it was worth doing the sidetrack, and it was. Don't forget, this year the well is going back as an appraisal well. They've just done a huge amount of seismic in the area. Absolutely certain. My contacts at uh, Ekinor, as it's now called, are telling me that they think there's more than just the two or three other uh, exciting uh, things on that license of, that Verbier is on. Uh, and I'm absolutely confident that uh, Jersey is uh, too cheap. Uh, Savannah is way too cheap, to be honest. I mean, I think that uh, Steve, uh, that, uh, Andrew not is doing a great job there, but uh, I think it's being held back a little bit at the moment. I mean, there are two, obviously there are two parts of Savannah. One is uh, the Seven Energy acquisition. Very few people would have taken the, gone to, you know, to all the hard work that the Seven Energy acquisition meant. It was months and months and months of putting all the bits together. The lawyers, the, the, the debt uh, was a mountain, and that was the reason why it was almost bust. But he could see 30,000 barrels a day, enormously profitable uh, mid-cap business. Uh, and I think that uh, the worry in the market is that it would be more expensive by now, if they had completed the deal, I still speak to people who say, I'm not sure that's going to complete, it's not going to work. And I think that um, I spoke to Andrew last week, I'm absolutely convinced like he is that it will go ahead. And then of course the other side of the business is the Niger drilling program, which of course has started becoming you know, successful. And they are also talking about an EPS uh, system where they can start bringing on production. Uh, and I think they'll get cash flow by the end of this year from there uh, in a modest amount and then more in due course. So, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that if you put together the Niger discoveries, the seven energy with the upstream and with 20% of AccuGas, they're going to be in a, in a, there in a very strong position. Um, Trinity Exploration, uh, Leo mentioned uh, in, in Trinidad, um, it's up 5.5%. It probably would have been more if it hadn't had quite a, a substantial raise recently. Uh, and I know there was, I had a lot of inbound about whether that raise was uh, sensible. They raised 20 million in order to pay back debt, sort out all the, <coughs> the debt they had with the government and PetroTrim when they had some difficulties. Um, more importantly, it, fin it refinanced the convertible that would have been most uncomfortable next January. So they had to do it, they've done it, and I think they've pushed them back down the, um, the, the, the steps a little bit, but it's in very good condition. It is building production, it's the, most, it's the highest margin business uh, in Trinidad. They've got potential East Coast asset called Galeota, which could be a company maker. So I think there's lots of uh, upside from there. I know I'm running short of time, but we've got uh, the, the, the baddies to go. Amerisur, which I get a lot of inbound from, um, I don't genuinely understand why Amerisur is this price because 
you know, I, the only reason it could be is because I think they, they've been saying they expect 7,000 barrels a day by the end of the year, and they're only on 5,000 at the moment for production. Uh, but they are working on production onshore, and they've got three most exciting uh, wells coming up. They've got the end sand anomaly uh, at Pintadello 1. They've got Indico 1, which is with ONGC in uh, CPO 5, and the Mirapariba 1 in, uh, in Put 8. Any or all of those would be extremely good news, so I'm very positive on that. 